Welcome to Notorious Minds, is where we examine those that have altered destiny and changed human history. Warning, this video contains violent content, graphic images, and descriptions which may be considered disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. It is said that the eyes are the windows to the soul. But one look into this man's eyes reveals that there is no love there, but pure darkness. One victim said his eyes were two black dead circles. His name is Anthony Edward Soule, and he is an American serial killer known as the Cleveland Strangler. But I'd like to call him the devil next door. In over two years, 11 women would go missing. This is his story. Anthony Edward Soule was born on August 19, 1959. He was born in East Cleveland, Ohio, one of seven children to single parent Claudia Gertrude Garrison. Seven other children belonged to Soule's sister also lived there, having moved in after the death of their mother from a chronic illness. His childhood home at 1878 Page Avenue in East Cleveland, Ohio, stood out in the 1960s it was lime green. It stands out now because it was the childhood home of Anthony Edward Soule. His mother, Claudia, worked as a dry cleaner. Neighbors remember the two-story two house between Euclid Avenue and Forest Hill Park had a nice backyard. Back then, it was overwhelmingly white, mostly working-class neighborhood, just beginning its slow descent into abject poverty. Anthony Edward Soule lived there with his mother, Claudia, and his maternal grandmother, Irene Justine. She headed up the household with his mother as well. His grandmother, as well as his mother, was very abusive toward the children. But at this time, what we see as clearly abuse, they only saw as discipline. Miss Claudia was tasked with taking care of 13, yes, 13 children. Claudia would subject her own grandchildren to physical abuse while her own children stood around and watched from adjacent rooms. Most mothers and grandmothers are very compassionate, loving, and caring, but Claudia could be what most consider sadistic. Clearly, Anthony may have learned some of his diabolical behavior from his mother. His father, Thomas Saul, worked in construction. He was an absent father. He left when Anthony was a baby. He was never really a part of his life. He never was talked about. For some reason, Anthony and his father didn't get along. Anthony would go on to say that there was no love in his house growing up, that he had no idea of what love was, he, that, he had no, that he had no idea of how to be affectionate. Anthony would go on later in life to say he was abused as a child. When he was approximately six years old, a female by the name of Princess sexually molested him on many occasions. Anthony would later say that he was exposed to sex acts around age five when he stayed at his sister Patricia's house. The men of the house would force themselves on the women and Anthony watched. Anthony said at one time even his mother would beat him out of his sleep with an extension cord. But if you spoke to Anthony's nieces, they would say that he was not abused. But just because they did not see it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Anthony would grow to have no conscience and grew to be a cold and calculating individual. Anthony's life was most likely traced back to what he learned from his mother through her own cruelty of her children and grandchildren. Two of Anthony's nieces said in an answer then whipped them with, e with electrical extension cords until they bled but the male children were not treated the same. It was psychotic, Leona said. Anthony was not beaten, both twins said, but he watched the beatings. Leona said that he also connived to create trouble for them. Anthony would secretly drink their grandmother's Pepsi and start a fight, then blame Leona, who got punished for it. If Anthony's childhood was as dysfunctional as is later described in court, it did not reflect his behavior as a child. But like I said, just because they didn't witness it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Anthony's, Anthony's nature developed out of watching years of abuse. He had to get it from somewhere. For Claudia held some kind of hatred toward the children. Could it be that she grew up with violence herself? 
oftentimes the abused become abusers. So Anthony grew up watching his mother's violence. He would go on to say his mother beat him with switches, broom handles, a cane, an iron cord. He said there was a lot of yelling and screaming in the house. Soul began raping his own niece, Leona, on a daily basis for two years, when she was 10 years old and he was 11. He would take Leona to his room, force her to strip naked, and would rape her with the threat of violence. Leona also would later state that her other uncles would follow suit and rape her as well. His niece would go on to say his sadistic behavior began as a small child. This behavior as a small child revealed how he saw women, that he was entitled to do whatever he wanted to them. Neighbors and a friend said he appeared to be a good child. He had a small circle of friends, and many remember him being respectful, kind, and a good student. He took school very seriously, and he loved playing chess. In his senior year of high school, he got his girlfriend pregnant. Her name was Twala, and she had a baby girl, and she named her Julie. When Anthony was in sixth grade, he learned to play the cello at school. Anthony's science teacher introduced him to playing chess, which he became very good at, for he continued to play chess even into adulthood. I would say that chess players are very strategic and calculating. Being very strategic helped Anthony later in life when he needed to gain women's trust. Anthony said he graduated from Shaw High School, but the school said that they had no record of it. By 17, he had already graduated and asked his mother to sign papers to allow him to go into the military. She said no. He finally convinced her, though, since he said he was going to be 18 later that year and he would do it himself anyway. So she agreed. At first, he was interested in the Army and took the interest test with them and passed. But he then changed his mind and went into the Marines instead because he said he heard that the Marines were tougher. Because... He was bullied in school as a child. He said he, had, he said he had a point to prove. If you were 18 in the late 1970s and you wanted to get out of a deteriorating East Cleveland and you wanted to get out fast, you would join the military. So Anthony Soule joined the Marines on January 24th of 1978. Soule entered the United States Marine Corps. He reported to boot camp at Paris Island, South Carolina. He was named honor graduate at his boot camp. He was the only one in his group to be promoted from private to private first class. It seemed that Anthony did well when the environment was structured and orderly. Then he went to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. The syllabus there included basic chokes, basic weapons of opportunity. He also learned electrical wiring. On July 13th of 1978, he was assigned to the 2nd Marine Aircraft Wing at Marine Corps Air Station in Cherry Point, North Carolina, as an electrician. So he spent almost five of his seven years in the Marines at Cherry Point and lived for at least part of that time in a trailer. In 1980, he spent a year overseas with the 3rd Force Service Support Group, then returned to Cherry Point. Sowell was ordered to the Marine Corps base camp in Butler in Okinawa Provincial, Japan on January 20th of 1984. Sowell met a young woman there and they got married. He said she was able to bring the best out of him. She was a fellow Marine. Her name was Kim Yvette Lawson. It was a civil ceremony performed by a magistrate in a historic courthouse in New Bern, North Carolina. He was 22. Her mother said her daughter told her Soul was drinking too excessively and she married him to save him from being kicked out of the military. She didn't want him to get a dishonorable discharge. Nora Lawson, Kim's mother, said her daughter was trying to get him through the Marine Corps. She discovered him the day she got out of the Marines in 1985. At one point in Japan, he was demoted from a sergeant to a corporal because after an alcohol-related incident with a military officer in Okinawa. Clearly, Anthony could be a mean drunk. After a year at Camp Butler in Okinawa, Japan, So went to Camp Pendleton, California. 
and he left with an honorable discharge on January 15, 1985. Even though one of his recorded rapes would be after the military, it is believed that he committed rapes while in the military. He would even tell convicts in jail later in life that he would tell sex workers to act out sex and bondage scenarios. A friend in the military said he even told him of a time that he choked a sex worker as well. Because of his violent nature, it would not be a far stretch to believe that he raped others, and it was not reported or believed. Although the Marine said he went AWOL for two months at one point, Sergeant Soul departed with a footlocker full of praise. One thing is clear, the Marines taught Soul how to subdue and kill using his hands and how to wield everyday objects as weapons. They both also had good Tim and Anthony also had good service records. During his seven years in the Marine Corps, he received a Good Conduct Medal with one service star, a Sea Service Deployment Ribbon, a Certificate of Commendation, a Meredith Mass, and two Letters of Appreciation. He acknowledged having family problems and increased aggressiveness when drinking at this time when he got out of the Marines. Kim divorced him later, but it is unclear why. Kim his ex-wife died in an accident at work in 1998 while Soul was serving time in Ohio Penitentiary. He then returned to his address on Page Avenue. During this time in East Cleveland, the population was now 90% black. One-fourth of East Clevelanders lived below the poverty level. City finances were in shambles, and much of Cleveland's area was inundated by crack cocaine. Between 1982 and 1984, the amount of cocaine in the U.S. increased by 50 percent. Up until this time, cocaine was seen as a rich man's drug, which the increase in product dealers looked for a new way to sell their large stash. They started making a smokable version that provided for more of a rush to the attic, but would wear off after about 10 to 15 minutes. They would sell it in small quantities. The quick high made it more addictive, plus the fact that it is sold at a cheaper price than cocaine, which made it ideal for the inner cities and the African American population. This devastated the black communities with more job loss and more crime. A new, smokable, potent form of cocaine that swept the country's urban areas in 1985. Crime rose in a new subset of female female addicts so desperate to get high that they would sell and barter their own bodies to get a few rocks of crack. Soul singled out black women desperate for crack knowing that society would not pay attention to the poverty-stricken crack addict looking for a fix. When women began to go missing, the police would not even do the basic investigation for this disenfranchised woman. At this time, Soul usually had at least six drinks nearly every day during this period of his life. He shared the attic apartment with his nephew. He took a lot of pride in keeping his area organized and clean, something that he probably got from the military. His ex, his ex high school girlfriend would go on to say when she saw him, he looked meaner. He had changed. He couldn't keep a job. He would drink so much he would black out. He started selling drugs at this time in order to make money. In July of 1989, 21-year-old Melvette Simmons, who was three months pregnant with her third child, she was one of 14 children who had grew up without a father in Arkansas. When she was little, her mother Aretha married a military man named Richard. When she was just three, her stepfather Richard decided he wanted to get out of the, wanted to get out of the South. He moved his family from Pine Bluff, Arkansas to Ohio. They lived in a nice neighborhood with lots of mansions and all white neighbors. But at, that, but at some point, all the wealthy neighbors started to move out of the city to suburbs. Then Melvet noticed how the neighborhood went down, criminals moving in and the police turning their heads. Then eventually her mother broke up with her stepfather and she found herself living on the streets. She then dropped out of high school at 16 years of age, then she started doing drugs and drinking. 
She had had her first child around this time. In July of 1989, she was living with her boyfriend and now three months pre pregnant. The evening of July 21st, she went out to meet up with some friends. She went to several bars in East Cleveland. At 6 a.m. the next day, she went to the hotel where her, bar where her boyfriend was selling drugs. When she got there, she noticed that there was police there, so she walked toward a payphone. She encountered a man there that approached her. She assumed he was there to buy drugs. She said he was a good talker, an ex-marine in good shape. She decided to leave to go home, and the nice man offered to give her a ride. His car was parked only a block away. They both used crack, and he had talked about getting high. They decided it was too dangerous to do it while the cops were around, so they decided to go back to his house at 1878 Page Avenue. When she went in, she smelled freshly baked cornbread. There were kids running around, so she felt safe. They went up to the attic that he used as an apartment. She considered having sex with him because he was nice and charming. She really liked his energy. But as soon as she got into his room, his face changed. As his eyes went black, she knew that she was in trouble. Anthony locked the door, put a heavy suitcase in the way to block her from leaving. Then he pulled out a knife, and for the next 12 hours he raped her. He would toy with her, telling her to get dressed, and then telling her to strip again. When she attempted to leave, he bound her hands with a tie and her feet with a belt, then gagged her mouth with a rag. Melvet started praying and continued to say, The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. When Anthony got tired, he said, You might as well say your prayers because I'm about to kill you. But I'm tired right now, and I'll do it when I wake up. When he fell asleep, she planned her escape. She found a, women, she found a window that led to the roof. They were three stories up. She said to herself, if she's going to die, she's going to die her way. She was still tied up, but she rolled off the bed to get to the window. She was scared she had wakened him up because she shook the bed when she got off. But he just kept snoring. Thank God he's a heavy sleeper. She made it to the window and maneuvered out onto the roof. It was dark outside and Melvet saw two women across the street. They, just, they didn't realize she needed help at first, but when she turned to show them that she was bound, they called the police. Soon a fire truck showed up to get her off the roof and the ambulance arrived to take her away to the hospital. She was badly injured. Anthony had cut her, beat her, and raped her. Anthony was then arrested and charged with her rape. After, and after making bail, he disappeared. He was on the run. On June 24th of 1990, he did it again. His victim, a 31-year-old pregnant woman, not sure what is about pregnant women, he spent the night drinking with her. He then took her upstairs where he choked her and raped her. She told him she was pregnant and begged him to stop. He just continued to attack her. Again, he fell asleep after the attack. We can see a pattern building. The woman was able to get away and report him. He was still asleep when the police arrived at the house and they arrested him. But the victim ultimately didn't follow up with the charges. Without her testimony, her case was dropped. But the officials were able to charge him for Melvet's assault. Melvet told the police he choked me real hard because my body started tingling. I thought I was going to die. On September 12, 1990, he was charged with kidnapping, rape, and attempted rape. He was given a plea bargain and pled guilty to attempted rape and served 15 years in prison. He went to several different prisons in Cleveland, but one of the first was Chillicothe Prison. He did well. He worked while he was in prison at the OPI, the Ohio Prison Industry, while at Chillicothe Afton Prison, where he worked in the kitchen. While in prison, he did well under the strict supervision of the guards. He was said to be a model prisoner. He worked in the dining hall as a line server. While incarcerated, he took courses called Living with Violence, Cage Your Rage, Positive Personal Change, and Drug Awareness Prevention. When his parole came up, 
The board denied it because they said his crimes were too violent. He was ultimately released after serving his entire sentence. He called on his marine training as an electrician and honed his culinary skills in the kitchen, which after his release in 2005, helped him earn a reputation for throwing good barbecues. Anthony, while in a controlled environment like the military, in prison, he would do well, but, let, but left to his own decisions, he would choose the worst. He then moved into the house of his late father's widow at 12205 Imperial Avenue in Mount Pleasant. After he moved in, his stepmother moved out to get medical care, and a family that rented part of the house eventually moved out as well. It was a white two and a half story double duplex. He completed Networks for Success, a program for ex convicts offered by the Towards Employment Nonprofit Agency. He started dating women who lived and hung out, crime ridden Mount Pleasant, he now called home according to two women's accounts. He started working at a nearby factory named Custom Rubber. Then he met Lori Frazier, a niece of Cleveland Mayor. Frank G. Jackson. The two got along well and he invited her out to dinner. Lori said he was very charming. It was very easy to talk to him. They talked about her kids and how she wanted to go back to school. She spent the night over his house and when she woke up he was gone. She came over to see him the next night and soon they were dating. She had been struggling with drug addiction since she was a teenager and Anthony helped take care of her. He would cook for her as she moved into his house on Imperial Avenue just after they had started dating when he had been supply he had been supplying her with alcohol and crack, but he wasn't getting high himself. She would get high and Anthony would drink and play video games. Their relationship went downhill when Anthony started getting high as well. After he started using drugs, his personality changed. He would become mean and have fits of rage. In April of 2006, Anthony got a tax refund check which he spent on drugs and alcohol. One day, Lori came home to a house full of girls he was giving drugs to. At one point, she told her friends Anthony tried to kill her. That was basically the end of their relationship. Anthony was walking over his sister's house one day after a big snowstorm in Cleveland. He saw an elderly woman shoveling snow on the street. He told the woman she shouldn't have to shovel the snow. She said she didn't have anybody else to do it. In February of 2007, Anthony would have a major heart attack after he stopped to help an elderly woman shovel her snow. When he was finished, he left and walked to his sister's house. When he got to his sister's house, he got sick and threw up. Unknowingly, Anthony had just had a heart attack. He then told his niece Danielle to give him a ride home because he couldn't make it on his own. After days of being sick, he finally collapsed on a bus on the way to the VA hospital. He then found out that he had had a heart attack. He would ultimately have to have a pacemaker. He had a difficult time recovering after getting the pacemaker. This made it difficult to work and eventually he was let go from his job in mid-2007. Anthony revealed later that after his heart attack, he would start hearing voices. Because he was a felon, it was hard for him to find work, so he started selling scrap metal. He would sell copper wiring and aluminum siding to construction crews. When Lori moved out in 2007, she said she smelled something that smelled like uh, decaying or death. When she moved out in 2007, she said the smell was probably from Ray's Sausage Shop, located next door to Soul's house. Soul became a member of an online dating service. He stated that he was a master looking for a submissive person to train. Anthony was a charmer. He charmed women into his house. And once in, he turned into the devil. His eyes as black as night reveal the cold and calculated evil that dwelled within. Crystal Dozier, age 38, grew up in Cleveland. She was, she was raised at King Kennedy Estates housing complex. Her mom, Florence, tried to provide a safe home for her four kids. At just 13 years young, Crystal had her first child. A year later, she was pregnant again. By age 21 years old, she had five children with her with her 21-year-old boyfriend who had a long arrest record. Crystal did her best to stay in school while family members babysat. She loved to sing and was in the school choir. Her older, her 
but her horrible boyfriend made it impossible as he abused and trafficked her in order for him to get drugs. Crystal lived with her mom until she was 17. One night, her mother woke up to Crystal's boyfriend beating her up. When she went to the kitchen, she found him choking Crystal. He told Florence to go back into her room, cursing at her. Florence, her mother, grabbed a knife and said, Let her go. I'll show you how much a bee I can be. Unfortunately, Crystal would end up moving in with her abuser. He would also start assaulting the kids. They were ultimately reported to CPS as unfit parents. The threat of losing her kids finally convinced her to leave her abusive boyfriend. She moved into her own apartment, but raising seven kids on her own was too much pressure for her, and her drug use escalated. She would leave home for days at a time. Social workers ended up taking her kids and moved them in with family and foster families. Her son Anthony said Crystal lost custody of him when he was just three years old. He didn't have a lot of memories of her because she wasn't around. He said he would find drug paraphernalia around the house as well as crack itself. He and his sister would often go hungry. He remembered keeping a jar of peanut butter in his book bag for the two of them. He would give a teaspoon of peanut butter to him and his sister for breakfast. Then we got home, they would have another teaspoon of peanut butter. Then at dinner time, they would have another teaspoon of peanut butter, and that is all they ate. On May 12, 2007, the day before Mother's Day, Crystal's son Anthony talked with her on the phone and stopped by to see her. He didn't call her on Mother's Day because he said she wasn't much of a mother, so he didn't want to wish her a happy Mother's Day. The next day, on the 14th, he tried calling her, but she didn't answer. He thought maybe she was upset because he didn't wish her a happy Mother's Day. Sometime around May 13th, Crystal met up with Anthony Sowell. Crystal lived in a house on Imperial and would often party at his house with others. Crystal had been tr trading sex for crack, but she didn't consider herself a, a sex worker. The morning of her disappearance, she was seen by her roommate. She called Anthony and then put on a tank top and jeans and headed by his house to party. The details of her murder and rape are not known, but she was ultimately found bound at the hands and feet with coaxial cable. A cloth was tied around her neck. Two trash bags were wrapped around her naked body and duct taped together. She was disposed of in a shallow grave in the backyard. Crystal's daughter, son, and sister reported her missing. The police would tell them she was an adult and she had the right to go missing. Anthony, her son, said it was terrible for them to say this. Police should not take away someone's hope. This was not the first time she had gone missing and the family accused the police of failing to do their job. The family took it upon themselves to post flyers and call hospitals. Anthony, her son, came to realize that his mother had demons since she since he is now a father himself. She did the best that she could do. She was loved and cared about. In June of 2007, neighbors on Imperial Avenue called the police to complain about a horrible smell on the street. This would come to be a regular occurrence. Health inspectors went to investigate, but they believed it was, it was coming from Ray's Sausage Company next door to Anthony Soule's house. It's now Christmas time of 2007. And Gladys Wade Thomas walks out of a store on Imperial Avenue. She's over there visiting her sister, and Anthony walks up behind her and says hello. She ignores him and keeps on walking. Anthony says Merry Christmas to her, and she says the same back to him, but keeps walking. Anthony says, Would you like to have a drink? Gladys says, No, thanks. I have my own. So Gladys starts walking down Imperial Avenue to catch the bus to go home. But she doesn't realize that Soul is walking right behind her. Anthony hits her from behind and knocks her out. She then wakes up as he's dragging her into his house. He grabs around her throat and starts to strangle her, and she passes out again. When she wakes up, she's in a locked room. When she tries to get out of the room, the door is locked. 
So she starts screaming. Soul opens the door and says, you can scream all you want. No one can hear you. Soul then proceeds to beat, beat on her. Gladys is fighting for her life. They struggle and she breaks loose and runs down the hall. Soul is right on her heels and run, as he's running after her. So she knows that she is no match for Soul face to face. So she grabs a hold of, uh, of Soul and runs into him and they end up falling down the flight of stairs. Now they're on the second floor. Soul starts to try to strangle her again. She scratches and tries to put her nails in his eyes and scratches around his eyes. Then she grabs his testicle and twists as hard as she can trying to yank those jokers off. Gladys is in the fight of her life. She puts her hand through a glass door and her hand starts to bleed. They then start tumbling down the final flight of stairs. When they hit the bottom stairs, Gladys slams up against the side door and it flies open. She then runs across the street to Best Chicken and Pizza and asks them to call the police. The manager says to get out of my store, you're bleeding on my floor. Soul runs in and says that witch stole money from me and I kicked her butt and kicked her out of my house. Because Gladys is a, a visitor in the area, so they choose to believe Anthony so well. Gladys runs out of the store and runs for her life. The confidence of that demon, he thinks he can talk his way out of anything. But this is the nature of a true psychopath. Unknowingly, Gladys is one of the rare ones to make it out of 12205 Imperial Avenue. Tashana Culver, age 31, lived only a few doors down on Imperial from Seoul. Tashana was a beautician and a nursing student. She had always had been a good student in school. She got pregnant her sophomore year, but she did graduate after graduation she started smoking crack. Then things really took a turn in her life. Her boyfriend was found shot in the head from an apparent suicide, addicted to crack. They went to rehab together and tried to get sober. Carl remembered a time walking around Cleveland with her during the harsh winters. Tashana didn't have winter boots and he was so worried about her feet being cold as they walked around town. He gave her $120 to go get some real boots. She came back in a pair of a snow, um, she came back in a pair of moon boots. He said were the ugliest shoes he had ever seen, but they were warm and she was happy. Carl also didn't have winter boots and he'd been tying plastic around his shoes to keep his feet dry. Tashana surprised him by using half the money he gave her to buy him some to buy him some boots. The two were together for seven years and had three kids together, but the kids lived with family. Tashana would trade sex for drugs, which Carl hated, but ultimately it was the only way they could get cracked. For a while, Tashana actually left Carl and moved into a house on appeal with her mother and sister. However, when they found out she was selling sex for drugs, they told her she had to leave because they didn't want the children to find out. Tashana had been estranged from her family for about a year when she went missing. The details of her disappearance are not clear. Wearing a brown shirt and brown pants and stuffed in a trash bag in June of 2008. Lashanda Long, age 25, came from a history of addiction. Her mother, Jewel, had been on drugs and so was her grandmother. She was born on March 19th of 1984 and had a rough start. Her father Jim worked as a corrections officer and tried to raise the kids with the help of his grandmother. With the help of the grandmother, his grandmother reported Jim and Jewel to the county for not being around enough for the kids. Lashanda ended up living with one of her father's sisters and really thrived at first. Eventually she left her aunt and went looking for her mother. She became pregnant at 14 and had three kids over the next three years. She had legal trouble and ended up in a juvenile detention center for which she lost custody of her children. She started using crack, but her dad Jim said that no matter what she was doing in her life, she would always call him on his birthday. When he did, didn't get, when he didn't get his birthday call in 2008, he knew something was wrong. Her murder is not that clear as well. Her remains were only a skull in a bucket in the basement on Imperial. The rest of her body was never found. It's believed that she was killed in August of 2008. Vanessa Gay would encounter Anthony next. She was 37, had loved going to school as a kid. She was an A student in high school. She had lots of dreams of maybe being a cosmetologist 
or a welder or even a truck driver. Her parents got a divorce when she was little and she remembered when her dad stopped showing up. She would sit in front of the window waiting for him to come back. She would often see sex workers meeting their johns outside that window. Things didn't go as she, as she planned. She found herself using crack. She got to the point where all she thought about was getting high. She would stand at the sink in the kitchen and couldn't figure out how to wash the dishes because all she wanted to do was get high. Basic household chores became impossible to do. All she wanted was crack. She lived with her husband who was also using crack and the two sold everything in the house. They even sold the kids toys. Her family ultimately did a drug intervention to try to get her help. She came home from buying crack and found her mom, cousin, four kids, neighbors, and son's friends on the front porch waiting for her. Vanessa had lost so much weight from drug use that she looked like a little girl. She was thin and her eyes were sunken in. As a result of looking so young, she got more work as a sex worker. She did have a set of rules, though to stay safe on the streets. She would not get into a car with anybody that looked too suspicious. She didn't go with anyone who looked strange. I'm sorry, Anthony looked strange. Maybe it's just me. In early September of 2008, Vanessa was working. She was standing outside of a bank when a man walked past her on a bike, talking on a cell phone. He walked past again a second time, and she had a feeling he was trying to get her attention. He said, he said loudly so she could hear, you know it's my birthday and I don't have anyone to celebrate with. She said, I don't celebrate birthdays, but happy birthday anyway. She wasn't sure if she should go with Anthony or wait for somebody else that she knew. But as they started to talk, people in the neighborhood would say hi to Anthony, which made her relax. The two chatted and he said he didn't want to get high alone. She told him she liked to cook and he said he could cook her under the table. He could make pinto beans and brown gravy that would blow her mind. He talked about his uh, time in the Marines and his love of chess. They got to his house on Imperial Avenue and as soon as they walked in it felt eerie. Up to this point there were no red flags but things took a sharp turn. He started closing all the windows and the doors. Her gut told her to leave and there was a bad smell and she brought it up to him. He said that was from the sausage back factory next door. She also noticed a rotting plate of a whole chicken sitting out. They went up to the third floor and she was actually enjoying the conversation. He then started pacing back and forth and she asked him, What's up? Are we going to smoke? Are we going to drink? What are we going to do? Then she noticed that the house was full of flies, which she assumed was from the spoiled food. She had a pipe and she handed it to him. He turned his back and she heard the sound of a lighter and a sizzle. Then suddenly he spun around and punched her dead in her face. She fell back and he said, take your clothes off, B. She took off her clothes and she looked into his eyes. She never saw anyone with eyes so evil. His eyes looked like two black circles. There was no glimmer of light in his eyes. He raped her for hours. He raped her orally, vaginally, and raging about what other women had done to him. How women shouldn't be using crack instead of being at home with their families. She nodded in agreement to try to calm him down. She asked him could she use the bathroom and he said okay. On the way to the bathroom there was a black tarp. There was a black tarp hanging on the wall. The plastic was pulled back a bit and she could see something was behind the tarp on the floor. It was a body without a head. She knew she could not show any fear or horror or upset Anthony. So they, after, after that they went back to his room and they both fell asleep. I'm not sure how she slept because I wouldn't have closed my eyes. I've been looking at him all night. She woke up in the morning to Anthony's arm around her as if they were a couple. Anthony let her get dressed and she asked if it, she could call her sister. He allowed her to call his sister and they talked about making macaroni and cheese. I'm not sure how she kept it together, but she did. She told him she was leaving as if what had just happened was no big deal. He kept saying she would tell on him if he let her go. She said, tell? Well, it might have been a little rough, but there's nothing to tell about. He went to get the keys to let her out. 
the front door. She stayed by his side the entire time, too afraid to let him walk behind her because she thought she would never make it out of that there if she did. At the door, he gave her his phone number and told her to come back on Monday when he got paid. Come back! She called the police to report what had happened, but they told her that she had to come down to the station to file a report. Unbelievable. She was too tired, too spent, too much in pain to try to make it to the police station, so she just didn't go. Unbelievable that a patrolman couldn't go by her, where she stayed at to see her. This was not the first time she had been raped, unfortunately, and when she tried to report it the last time, her attacker got away with it. Michelle Mason will be the next to feel Anthony's wrath. She was just 16 when she left home to head to New York. Her family didn't hear from her for five years, and when, she, when they did hear from her, she had contracted HIV from using drugs. She was also diagnosed as being bipolar and seemed to do well when she was on medication. She had two sons, but she didn't have custody of them because of her drug addiction. Michelle was shot in the head after a dispute with a man who claimed she had unprotected sex with him without revealing she was HIV positive. Michelle was last seen by her family in November of 2008. They reported her missing and hung up posters around the neighborhood, but the police did nothing. Even though many women who had now come up missing in the neighborhood, they couldn't understand why police had not done anything, especially since Anthony is a registered sex offender. On November 10th, she went out to a party. She would later be found strangled with an electrical cord, and her hands were bound behind her back. She was wrapped in clear plastic and buried in the yard on Imperial Avenue. Tanya Carmichael, age 53, would encounter Anthony next. In November of 2008, she was pregnant with her first child at the age of 16. She dropped out of high school. As a result, she was a mother of three. She struggled with drug addiction for years. She would sometimes stay away from home for days, but she always kept in touch with her family. Her family knew something was wrong when she hadn't picked up her paychecks, paychecks for weeks. Her mother tried to file a missing persons report on December 2nd, but the officers told her that her daughter would be back when the drugs ran out. Unbelievable. Tanya was murdered by strangulation with a phone charger cord wrapped around her neck. Her hands were bound behind her back and she was buried in the yard on Imperial Avenue. Seoul would increase in, fre in his frequency of victims in 2009, sometimes killing two in the same month. Kim Yvette Smith, age 44, went by Candy. She was an artist and a talented singer she started using drugs her senior year in high school. He graduated and attended Community College of Art and Dance. Her parents split up when she was young, but she stayed close to her dad, Donald, who said she was his heart and he really cared about her recovery and tried to help her get off the drugs by putting her in rehab. But he said she would get off of one drug and start up an, on another drug. Her father had surgery that left him in a wheelchair. Kim then had a new motivation to get sober so she could take care of her beloved father. On January 17th of 2009, Kim went shopping with her aunt to get new clothes to sing in the choir. She was really trying to get her life together. She took her dad out for Chinese food and then headed over to her boyfriend's house. She met, never made it there. Undoubtedly, she encountered Seoul on her way. Kim was murdered with her hands and her feet tied with cloth. She was wrapped in a plastic and buried in the yard. She was, on, she was the only victim who didn't have kids. Nancy Cobb would be next, age 45. She was a grandmother of five and had been working in construction. She had three kids and doted on her grandchildren and loved taking them to the park. She started using crack after a bout with depression. On August 29th of 2009, she spent the day with her family. She went to make a quick run to the local store and said she would be right back. They never saw her again. Her daughter reported her missing and posted signs around the neighborhood, but the police didn't help. Nancy was strangled with a cloth 
tied around her neck and her wrists were tied with rope. She was wrapped in a black plastic bag and a comforter and put in the third story crawl space in April of 2009. Amelda Hunter would be next, age 47. She was actually the cousin of Crystal Dozier who died in 2007. Melda was 14 when she she became impregnated by a teacher who got her drunk at a party and raped her. Her daughter was born deaf with cerebral palsy. She was in a relationship with, with an older man who didn't like the fact that she d did drugs and tried to get her to quit. She worked as a hairstylist and a home health aide. She loved reading and her son would say that she loved reading. Her son said she would often go mi missing when she went out on benders, but they spent a lot of time together cooking and singing. Amelda had known Anthony for a while, and they often partied together. She called him her buddy, and she always talked about how nice he was or how nice he pe appeared to be. She disappeared in April of 2009. She was strangled using a strap of a suitcase and wrapped in a heavy-duty trash bag. He really loves those trash bags. She was buried in a shallow grave in the yard, also in the same month. Her family did not report her missing until after police began removing bodies from Anthony's house. Janice Webb was next. She was 48 and had long struggled with crack addiction. She tried to get clean many times over several d decades, but, but she eventually found her way back. She stayed in touch with her family throughout the years and could always be counted on to show up for family parties and holidays. She spoke with her sister, Audrey, almost every day. Audrey said Janice knew she was loved, and the last time they spoke, Janice said she was coming over, but she never made it there. When she came up missing in June of 2009, her family hung up missing posters all over town. Mysteriously, the posters on appeal were always taken down. Janice was strangled with a belt and her hands were tied with shoelaces in the front of her body. She was gagged with a shirt. She was covered in a mound of dirt in the basement in June of 2009. Talasia Forsen, age 33, mother of three, loved poetry, styling hair, and arranging flowers. She was adopted by her mom, Inez, and she was nine years old. Talasia had feelings of abandonment after hopping between foster families and struggled to adjust. She started taking drugs when she was 14. She lost custody of her kids after a social worker said she did not complete a drug program. Talasia was devastated and had her children's names tattooed on her body. On June 3rd of 2009, Talasia brought, brought a bag of groceries to her mother Inez and stayed over to chat, cook, and clean. Talasia kissed Inez on the forehead as she left, saying she'll be back next week. That was the last time her mother ever saw her. She was strangled using a cloth. She was wearing a sleeveless shirt, and her bottoms were removed. There was a kitchen knife found inside her body. She was placed in the third floor sitting room June of 2009. Although she had been missing since June, her mother did not report her missing until she heard the news coverage regarding the dead bodies discovered at Soul's house. Then there was Diane Turner, age 48. She had five children, but she had lost custody due to the drugs. Losing her kids put her into a deep spin of, of guilt and shame. Diane appeared in September. Diane disappeared in September of 2009. Her co-workers noticed she had stopped coming to work, but she was not reported missing to police. Her body was badly decomposed, and the cause of her death was listed as homicidal violence. Her ankles were wrapped in a black plastic bag. Her body was placed in the third floor sitting room close to, to Lacia. On September 26 of 2009, authorities stopped by Anthony's house not to investigate any of the missing women or the awful smell permeating from his house, but just to make sure that he was at the same address according to his parole guidelines. In September 2009, later that day, Latonda Billups, a.k.a. Lala, 36, 
who grew up hearing how addictive crack was and how people would do anything to get it. She'd been a good kid, but when she turned 13 and 14, she just wanted to go out to parties. She started disobeying her mom and hanging out with friends, drinking and smoking pot. One night, a friend of hers was part she was partying with was smoking crack and she decided to try it. It was a rush that went all over her body. In the beginning, she would just smoke once a week, then a couple of times a week. Then she had somebody supplying her with drugs. Then she finally ran out of money. Lala moved to Imperial in 2007, but she had known Lori Frazier, Anthony's ex-girlfriend, since they were teens. She had smoked with Lori and the man she knew as Tone a bunch of times. Even after Lori left, she would hang out with Anthony from time to time. That night, Lala was standing in front of a store when Anthony walked by with two bags full of 40 ounces of beer. She asked him could she have some beer. He invited her to his house. They headed to the second floor, but when they hung out together in the past, they would always go upstairs to the attic. She asked him, why aren't we going upstairs to the attic? He said, it's dirty up there. Yeah, it's dirty up there with two bodies. There were two bodies that were already lying in the open upstairs. They smoked together, and then he brought her to another room. In the other room, there was a piece of cut cable cord and a blanket on the floor. He brought brought in a chair. He asked her to turn around. She thought she was just showing off her body. And then he grabbed her by the back of the neck and started to, to try to strangle her. She pushed at him. She pushed at him and he hit her in the face hard. He ripped her shirt and made her turn on her stomach and pull the cable around her neck. She blacked out and he raped her. When she woke up, her neck was burning and she was wet because the beer had spilled on the floor. Anthony was shocked to see the fact that she was awake because he thought he had killed her. She told him she was leaving and she was never coming back again. He said he was going to kill her and then kill himself because he was going to jail. But she... She, she said, you're not going to jail, but I ain't coming over here anymore. She started to get dressed. Lala told him, I thought you were my friend, but you tore my sweater. At this point, he was coming down from his high, and he told him uh, that he was sorry and that he would buy her another sweater. Anthony walked her downstairs and stood in the doorway watching her as she, go, as she left, and as she walked down the street. When she got out of his line of sight, she took off running. She reported the rape, and a rape kit was done. She wasn't contacted by the police for three weeks. Three weeks. On October 29th of 2009, Latonda Billups, Lala, filed rape charges against Soul. She stated that she had left her panties in his house. Don Morris, 51, would be next. She had struggled with addiction, but had gone through many stints of rehab. She would stay sober for a couple of years, but ultimately relapsed in October of 2009. She had mostly been off drugs and had been doing her best to stay busy and out of trouble. On October 19th, she cleaned around the house and went to Bible study at Mount Pleasant. She met up with a friend for a drink, which turned into partying at a friend's house. At 5.30 a.m., Sean and some friends headed to a gas station that would open soon so they could buy some beer. A man got off the bus and approached the group and asked for a cigarette. He introduced himself as Tone and bought them all wine and beer. They all drank, they all drank together, and around 7 a.m., Anthony invited Sean over. She knew her husband would be upset that she stayed out all night, so she decided to delay the fight a little longer. Inside Anthony's house, he lit some incense and put on some music. They smoked and drank together, and she went to leave at around 9 a.m. Anthony walked her to the door to say goodbye, but as Sean walked down the street, she realized that she left her ID inside. Anthony let her back in, and as she walked up upstairs, he put her in a chokehold. Almost got away. He told her if she was, if she screamed, fought, or tried to get away, he would kill her. Once upstairs, he ordered her to take off her clothes and raped her. At one point, Sean screamed from the pain, and Anthony got up to close the windows. She realized that she was going to die. 
and she spotted an open window that he hadn't closed yet. She said a prayer to God, say, God, uh, I seem to have got myself in a bad situation. I'm about to jump out this window, but please, please don't let me die. She went to the window and kicked out the screen. She climbed outside and planned to lo safely lower herself down to the ground from the two-story window. Anthony tried to stop her. He tried to pull her back in, but he didn't have the strength to, so he shoved her to, and made her fall hard on the pavement below. The blow to the pavement fractured her skull, broke eight ribs. Security footage from a nearby store actually recorded the whole scene from Sean falling out to Anthony coming out to try to get her back in the house. They were both naked. A neighbor saw her fall and called the police. An ambulance arrived and took her to the hospital. Sean had a brain aneurysm and had to undergo brain surgery. When she awoke days later, she asked for her phone to call her husband. The nurse told her that her husband was right with her in the ambulance. Sean looked at the nurse and said, that was not my husband. So called her while she was at the hospital and threatened her. She was afraid of Anthony would track her down. So she told police come to see her that Anthony was her boyfriend and that it was an accident. In October 27, uh, 2009, Lala finally heard back from the police. She met with the detectives about her rape. The police, a warrant was issued for his arrest, and a police SWAT team went to Sowell's house. Back during, those, back during that time in Cleveland, during the crack era, SWAT teams would go to serve warrants at people's houses because before then, when police used to go to the houses, they were out, out, um, outgunned by the criminals, so they started sending the SWAT team. So the SWAT team went to Anthony's house, but when they arrived, he wasn't there. When they went in, they discovered two dead bodies. They immediately sealed off the house, locked everything up, and exited out of the house and called the homicide detective. Office, the investigators Melvin Smith and Lem Griffin worked the investigation. There was rat feces covering the floor, and I mean all of the floor. Rats feeding off of dead bodies, dead flies hanging from the walls. As the detectives started searching the house for more bodies, they found a mound of dirt under the basement stairwell. When they looked at the dirt, they noticed that it was on top of the concrete floor. They realized that there was another body under the stairwell and there was a decaying skull in a red bucket. Everywhere you step, you were stepping on rat feces, dead flies, and an overpowering stench of decomposing bodies. Another body was found in a bag. An additional body was found in the crawl space with the same type of dirt that was behind the stairwell. So he was bringing in dirt to make his own little sinister graveyard inside his house. So in total, there were four bodies upstairs, a skull, an additional body in the basement. So that is what prompted the investigators to look on the grounds outside to see if there were more bodies. They located six more bodies in the yard. But the problem was that Anthony Soule wasn't home when the police entered his home. So the hunt was on to find the Cleveland Strangler. For two days, police would search for Anthony. Suddenly, his sister, Teresa, gets a phone call from her brother. Teresa, I've done something bad. His sister says, what is it? Anthony says, I can't tell you, but when it comes out, I'm going to be famous. Are you going to turn yourself in? Anthony says, I don't know yet, and hangs up. Teresa then gets a knock on the door. It's a complete... It is the Cleveland Homicide Detective. We found bodies in your brother's house. Do you know where he is? Teresa, looking shocked at them, said, I have no idea where he is. Lady, later, Anthony would meet Teresa on the street. I've done something horrible, but it's all true. Anthony left her. Teresa's life would change forever. Even her children would pay a price at school. She would now be the sister of a serial killer. And life would not be easy. She would lose jobs because she is Anthony Sowell's sister. Sowell finally was taken into custody two days later when a couple of people saw him out in the open on the street and called the police. Invader, investigators determined that he would start by having oral sex, then vaginal sex, then sodomy, 
all while he's strangling you to death. He knew how to charm them, talk to them, and get them to trust him. That's how he lured them into his house. He was very personable until the moment you walked into his house. Then he would turn into a deviant devil and attack you. You never truly know what's going on in the mind of someone else. He was living in a house alone. He had his own makeshift kitchen, his little, a little table and chair in his room. Sol was charged with 85 counts of murder, rape, kidnapping. He, he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, but he later just changed it to, to plain old not guilty. On July 21st of 2011, he was convicted of all but two counts against him. On August 10th, jurors recommended the death penalty on, for Seoul. And on August 12th, Judge Dick Ambrose upheld the jury's recommendation. His trial was originally supposed to start on June 2nd of 2010, but was repeatedly delayed. First on September 7th to give the attorneys more time to prepare, then on the 14th, then on May 2nd to at the request of his attorneys who needed more time to examine thousands of records of hours of surveillance videos. Surveillance video footage shot from the property next door to Seoul's house. Later on June 6, at the request of the prosecution due to scheduling conflicts, the trial began on June 6 of 2011. Seoul was charged with 11 counts of aggravated murder, 74 counts of rape, kidnapping, tampering with evidence, abuse of a course of a corpse. On September 14th, he was placed on death row and imprisoned at Chillicothe Correctional Institute where he had been before. Welcome home. Robert Saberna, an investigative reporter who interviewed Anthony Sowell while he was in prison, asked him, when people ask why you did it, what should I tell them? Sowell answered him with four words and he said, Abuse children grow up, which is very chilling and cautionary tale. There are consequences to when people abuse their children. You never know when you might be creating a monster. Anthony tried to appeal his sentence many times, Brother, you are not getting out. East Cleveland police also reopened several cold cases from the 1980s. Murders by strangulation were similar to and had stopped around 1989 when Seoul went in prison for the first time. The, same, the FBI also gathered information to see if Seoul may have been linked to unsolved cases in cities where he once lived, but to this date none have been found. Seoul most certainly would not have stopped in his killings based on how he started to increase before he was captured. His defense team tried to say his upbringing drove him to such extremes, but plenty of people live there through dysfunctional abuse and don't murder and live with the dead. During his trial, Soul would apologize for his actions. Well, the only thing I want to say is that I'm sorry I know that might not sound like much, but I truly am sorry from the bottom of my heart. This is not typical of me. I don't know what happened, I can't explain it. But I know it's not a lot, but that's all I can give you. The jury didn't buy it. They said his statement, which was guided by questions from his lawyer, sounded rehearsed and lacked remorse. Jurors sat through weeks of disturbing and emotional testimony, skeletal corpses lying on autopsy tables, and listening to the police describe how their bodies had been left to rot at Soul's Cleveland home and in his backyard. And the jury being duly impaneled and sworn do hereby find that the aggravating circumstances which the defendant was found guilty of committing do outweigh the mitigating factors presented in this case by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We therefore unanimously find that the sentence of death should be imposed upon the defendant, Anthony Saul. All our verdicts, uh, juror number one. Yes. And juror number two, are these your verdicts? Juror number three, are these your verdicts? Yes. Juror number four, are these your verdicts? Yes. Juror number five, are these your verdicts? Yes. Juror number six, are these your verdicts? Yes. Juror number seven, are these your verdicts? Yes. Juror number eight, are these your verdicts? In December of 2011, his former residence at 12205 Imperial Avenue was demolished on the orders of the city leaders. 
On January 21st, on January 21st of 2021, he began receiving end-of-life care at Franklin Medical Center in Columbus for a terminal illness. Anthony Edward so was able to escape his lethal injection when he died on February 8th, 2021 at Franklin Medical Center. And on July 16th of 2021, Ground was broken for the Garden of Eleven Angels Memorial on the former Seoul property. It was dedicated on November 6, 2021. Anthony Seoul lived in a house of horror, disgust, and filth, making a makeshift tomb for several of his victims throughout the house and even in the backyard. We can see from his upbringing how violence was formed in him through what he learned at an early age. But our upbringing should never be an excuse for this kind of malignancy. For when it's all said and done, we have the ability to choose not to be a monster. The prosecutor said during his trial that when Anthony Soule had his heart attack, the prosecution said during his trial that when Lori Frazier moved in, she was hooked on crack and he was just drinking. But when he got hooked on crack, Lori Frazier decided she wanted to get clean. So when Anthony had his heart attack, Lori Frazier moved out in order to get off of crack. And when he got out the hospital and came back home, Lori was gone. When he tried to get Lori to come back to him, she refused because she's trying to get clean and she can't live with a crack addict. So because she wouldn't come back, Anthony was enraged, and this was in early 2007, and his first victim in Imperial Avenue was in May of 2007. So he was making all those women pay for the fact that what because Lori would not come back to him. Thank God his violence and diabolical nature was finally exposed. May Crystal Dozier, Tashana Culver, LaShanda Long, Michelle Mason, Tanya Carmichael, Nancy Cobbs, Amelda Fortson, Janice Webb, Kim Yvette Smith, and Diane Turner. May they all rest in eternal peace. And to all, all of his many survivors, I hope they find the help that they need and become everything that God intended for them to be. Thank you for watching. May God bless you all. This is Notorious Minds. Please like share, and share this video and by all means subscribe. Please click the notification bell and you will be notified every time I upload a new video. Be safe out there. Until next time.